Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. A deep pocket exists between the first and second maxillary premolars. Its surgical elimination will be demonstrated. The topical anesthetic has been applied. A local anesthetic is infiltrated in the buccal and labial areas. It is also injected in the palatal tissue infiltrating from the central incisor to the second premolar. Because of the looseness of the teeth in this area, they have been previously stabilized with the use of an aid splint, which consists of twisted stainless steel wire covered with acrylic. The splint extends from the premolar to the incisor and has reduced the mobility patterns to zero in this segment. The deepest defect is between the first and second premolar, on the palatal aspect, there is a deep pocket extending into the osseous tissue. This actually is a bony defect which is sometimes classified as an infrabony pocket with one osseous wall. After the anesthetic solution has been administered, the pattern of pocket depth is explored with a calibrated periodontal probe. This instrument is slipped into the pocket and extended to the base of the pocket. By laying the probe on the outside, one can see that the base of the pockets extend toward the mucogingival junction. This indicates to the clinician that the traditional gingivectomy procedure would be contraindicated. If these pockets were eliminated, the remaining attached gingiva would be lost. Our objective must be to preserve as much attached gingiva as possible. Examination, including probing of the pockets, indicates the procedure of choice. Notice this area, where considerable depth is present between the two maxillary premolars. The procedure of choice in this case, which would enable the clinician to gain access to the underlying bone and eliminate the bony defect, as well as eliminate the superbony pockets and preserve the attached gingiva, is the apically repositioned flap procedure using an internal beveled incision. This dental radiograph shows the area in discussion. Note the aid splint used to reduce mobility of the involved teeth. There is some resorption between the canine and first premolar. There is also resorption of the interdental septum between the first and second premolars. This corresponds to the area where a deep pocket was probed. With this crane kaplan pocket marker, three markings are made on the labial mucosa overlying each tooth. The purpose of using pocket markers in the apically repositioned flap is to enable the clinician to determine the location of the base of the pocket and the crest of the alveolar process. The flat edge is placed into the pocket, the beaks are brought together and kept parallel to the long axis of the tooth. Noticing that the pocket depth approaches the mucogingival junction, we can understand why the gingivectomy procedure should not be used in this situation. The greatest depth on the buccal and the palatal aspect is between the premolars. Once the pocket markings have been made on the labial and buccal surfaces, the same is repeated on the palatal side. We make a mesiopalatal, a direct palatal, and a distal palatal marking for each tooth in this segment. Again, the beaks are kept parallel to the long axis of the tooth. The greatest depth in this particular quadrant 
exists on the mesial of the second premolar and on the distal of the first premolar. One notes that the pocket markings extend for a considerable distance onto the palatal aspect. Castroveo blade breaker and knife are used to make the internal beveled incision. This incision follows the gingival sulcus with the blade aiming for the alveolar crest. An attempt is made to retain the pattern of the interdental papillae. The incision extends from the distal of the last tooth in the segment to the mesial aspect of the maxillary central incisor. The use of a razor blade in this area permits an extremely fine and thin internal beveled incision. The same is repeated on the palatal aspect. If the palatal tissue is too thick to use the razor blade for the internal beveled incision, a scalpel can be substituted to accomplish the same purpose. The internal beveled incision permits the removal of the inner lining of inflammatory tissue of the pocket. Here, retracing the incision, the palatal internal bevel will be removed. Once the internal bevel incision has been completed on the buccal and palatal surfaces, the number 11 Goldman Fox knife, which is an interproximal knife, is used to take out the inner lining of the pocket. This tissue is removed from the labial and palatal aspects of all teeth in the area. Any tags of loose tissue are also removed. Once this inner lining has been completely taken out, one will be able to reflect the flap. It's important to remove any loose tags of granulomatous tissue as seen here being accomplished by the Goldman Fox number no. two curette. The fewer tags inside the flap, the better the healing will be. The inner lining of the palatal flap is now being removed with a number no. 11 Goldman Fox knife. At times, this can be accomplished in one strip, and in other instances, individual tissue fragments will be removed. Periosteal elevator is used to reflect a full thickness palatal flap and enables the clinician to gain access to the underlying bony deformities. Once the tissue has been reflected, the pattern of the osseous defects will be easily seen. Distal to the second premolar, it appears advantageous to utilize a distal wedge procedure to take out a wedge of tissue and enable the buccal and palatal surfaces to be properly blended. It also will permit the proper contour distal to the premolar. The wedge of tissue is seen at the end of the probe. 
It has been dissected with a scalpel and will now be removed from the area. Removal of this distal wedge will also permit better conjure of the distal aspect of the second premolar. It will reduce the possibility of a trough, which could act as a food retention site in that location. The intrabony defect is seen with a curette in position between the two premolars. Since it does not have three osseous walls, it is not amenable to a reattachment procedure. Since it does not have two walls, one would not consider the use of autogenous implant. The proximal wall appears to be the single wall remaining which is being traced by the periodontal probe. The contour and morphology of this defect guides the clinician in selecting the osseous surgical method for its removal. Therefore, by osteoectomy, this one wall will be removed and the infrabony defect eliminated. The buccal flap is now going to be reflected. This is also a full thickness flap reflected by a periosteal elevator. It will permit access to the underlying osseous tissue and at the same time will retain the zone of attached gingiva on the flap. Reflecting the flap enables the clinician to see the pattern of the underlying alveolar crest. Water spray is used to remove any debris fragments. The defect is now seen between the two premolars from the buccal aspect. Having cleaned out the soft tissue fragments with a curette, this pocket will be eliminated by the use of hand and rotating instruments. The instrument now being seen is an anterior curette, removing fragments of soft tissue left behind. Osseous nippers are used to remove a small piece of the interdental septum and reach the bottom of the defect. This begins the contouring of the interdental problem between the maxillary first and second premolar. A vertical groove or spillway is created with this instrument. Curette is again used to remove any loose pieces of bone and any remaining soft tissue fragments. Care is taken to try and create physiologic osseous architecture. This term implies that the interdental septum extends more occlusally than the adjacent buccal crest. This is the shape the bone had prior to the development of the defect. With a Weedlestat chisel, further osseous contouring is accomplished prior to the use of the rotating burr. The double-ended Weedlestat chisels are useful instruments in attempting to eliminate one-wall defects interdentally. The chisel may be worked from the buccal and go completely through to the palatal aspect. It can also be conjured from the palatal side. Coarse diamond stones are used for osseous conjuring. One should be careful to use a water spray and place very little pressure on the osseous tissue. It is important to be careful of the tooth structure in the area so that gouges or irregularities are not made in the tooth surface. The 
Accentuation of the interdental groove is also accomplished between the canine and the first premolar. This will be repeated in other areas. Debris fragments are removed by the curette and irrigation. The use of the ocean bean chisels one and two enables the clinician to create physiologic architecture in this premolar region. Curettes again are repeatedly used to remove any loosened fragments. The same procedure is repeated on the palatal aspect in an attempt to eradicate the bony defect between the two premolars. Here we see the ocean bean chisel being used on the palatal aspect to correct the bony contour between the premolars. Examining the osseous tissues from the labial and buccal, one notes that the contour has been improved and that a rise interdentally exists between the two premolars, whereas before this was reversed, in that the interdental tissue did not come down occlusally as much as the adjacent buccal and lingual crest. The interdental grooves are noted. The flap can now be positioned about one millimeter occlusal or incisal to the crest and secured with either continuous or interrupted sutures. Suturing and positioning of flaps is demonstrated in part two of this film series. The suturing technique that is being shown was selected after the periodontal osseous surgery had been completed. This technique is one which will permit suturing of the buccal flap independently of the lingual or palatal flap. It is performed with a continuous suture which is initially secured at the distal end of the flap. One end of the suture is cut off. The needle is then passed interdentally below the contact area. The suture is brought around the lingual aspect of the first premolar and carried back through the interdental space on the mesial side of this tooth. Then the needle is placed through the interdental papilla between the canine and the first premolar and carried back to the palatal side. The suture is brought around the lingual of the canine and back through the interproximal space between the canine and lateral incisor. The needle is inserted through the labial aspect of the interdental papilla and carried back through the same interdental space to the lingual side. The suturing procedure is repeated with the central incisor, but this time making sure that there is enough slack kept on the palatal strand so that when the needle is passed back to the lingual aspect, the suture can be tied.
The same suturing procedure is repeated on the palate to immobilize the palatal flap. This suturing technique adequately secures the flaps and assures close adaptation of the soft tissue to the teeth and bone. The margin of the flap is approximately one millimeter coronal to the alveolar crest. Using independent sutures on the buccal and palatal flaps is necessary because these flaps will be placed at different heights on the teeth. If a single suture joined the two flaps together, it would not be possible to locate them precisely. The same procedure, using several independent sutures rather than a single continuous suture, would have achieved the same results. Close adaptation of the flaps to the underlying bone and root surfaces is desirable to enhance healing and reattachment. This approximation will also prevent the periodontal dressing from getting under the flap. Teflon coated sutures may be substituted for the silk sutures used in this demonstration. However, these plastic covered sutures are more prone to untie and require two or three extra knots. After the palatal tissue has been secured, the distal wedge incision is closed. Note how the removal of this small wedge has eliminated any soft tissue overlap distal to the premolar. The area is covered for 30 seconds with a sterile gauze dipped in warm water. This further adapts the tissue to the bone and helps to eliminate any submucosal hemorrhage. The sutures are carefully checked to make certain that the soft tissue flaps are properly secured. appears to be adequate closure of the soft tissue distal to the premolar with a minimum of underlying osseous tissue exposure. The packing that is initially placed over the buccal and palatal surfaces is a non-eugenal dressing of the Bayer-Sumner formula. It is softened in hot water placed on the buccal and palatal aspects. The pack is locked interdentally with college pliers. The 
stability of the flap will be further ensured by the use of a zinc oxide and eugenol preparation. This Kirkland type pack is placed on top of the first dressing. The pack is muscle trimmed to eliminate overextension. Adhesive surgical foil is placed over the site to help protect the dressing during the next few hours when it will harden. This is the area five months later. Probing on the buccal surface shows that there are normal crevices about one and a half millimeters deep around the teeth. The gingival form is physiologic and there is a sufficient zone of attached gingiva present. The gingival tissues are firm and only minimal bleeding accompanies the probing. The gingival contours on the palatal aspect show that the deep defect between the premolars has been eliminated and replaced by a shallow crevice. Physiologic gingival form is present throughout. The tissue, distal to the second premolar, rises toward the tooth which is the normal contour for this area. Restorative work can now be initiated to replace the temporary aid splint. to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.